Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Advanced Strategies in Gwent. This time we're going to be taking a look at the value of being uninteractive. And when I say the value of being uninteractive, I don't mean playing like no unit decks. And I, I mean like more making suboptimal plays that sometimes does allow you to potentially find win conditions in situations where you might not have otherwise had one. So what do I mean when I say an interactivity i mean basically playing in a way that gives your opponent um removal cards the damage cards a very difficult time in finding value um, and this doesn't have to be by playing special cards it can also be playing cards that are very low to the ground it can be cards that are very low strength that your opponent might not have a very easy time maybe poisoning or damaging because they have a lot of armor or they're, they're too small bodies for your opponent to actually want to damage them um, and there are many situations that went where playing in this way, especially in round in a short round three or even in round one, if you go second, um, can be quite beneficial. And it's also important to know when this is, this is applicable, when this isn't applicable. Again, you got to know your opponent's deck. It is very important to actually know what your opponent's deck is and how you can make things awkward. And for that reason, I'll probably refer you back to another one of my videos where I spoke about identifying your opponent's deck because this requires you to actually know what your opponent's deck is is so that you know exactly their strengths, their weaknesses, how much proactivity they have. Obviously being uninteractive against some decks, they don't care. Some decks are very proactive. Monsters, for example, can be very proactive. They don't really care if you're playing uninteractive a lot of the time. So it does require you to understand very much what your opponent's deck is and how you can make it awkward for them. So very important to understand that before you watch this video. Anyway, let's get into some uh, some examples and some gameplay and show you exactly how you can be uninteractive and how it can make things very, very difficult and awkward for your opponent. So for this scenario, I'm up against Nilfgaard and Nilfgaard quite often is a type of faction that does struggle um, with proactivity. And look at my hand, and this is actually a really great hand to have here. I have a lot of specials and this could be this type of hand would be very bad on blue coin um, but because we're on red coin because we get to go second we can be somewhat uninteractive and make things very very awkward for our opponents so i'm going to keep all these special cards except for this i'm going to keep all the rest of these special cards and i'm going to use this to be annoying as possible for my opponent make things absolutely um an, an absolute nightmare for him in terms of proactivity so our opponent started off with enforcer now that is his product to play. Now, I could play something like a Slice of Ductress, try get the engine going nice and early. Now, typically, this is the type of card you want to play as early as possible because it is an engine card. It gets value over time. But I'm going to get different type of value. I'm going to get uninteractive value. I'm going to force my opponent to play proactively. And let's see if he has another proactive player. I'm going to go ahead and play this Assault onto that Imperial Enforcer. And see what he's going to be able to do as his next proactive play. Because he might not have a way of doing of playing again proactively. So let's see what his response is going to be to this. He's going to flip the Magic Lamp. And he's going to go for a self turn adjust. Now, if he's making this kind of play, we can tell that his hand is very, very reactive. And he obviously can't deal with me not putting any units on my side of the board. He has a bunch of cards that probably do damage. And by me playing uninteractively on that assault and delaying my seductress, it's forcing him to make suboptimal plays. Now I'm gonna force him to be proactive again. I'm gonna take a poison on that. And let's see if he can um let's see what his proactive play is gonna be now. Because now he has to go proactively yet again, and it could be difficult for him to be proactively another time around. Let's see what his answer is gonna be. And he's going to play a proactive enforcer now, or crossbow and roll. And again, this card deals two damage. I have no units on my side of the board. So this card just plays a three-point card. He clearly cannot play um, proactively. So I'm going to be uninteractive yet again and poison him another time. Now, again, this type of hand is only working because of the fact that I'm on red coin. This wouldn't work if I was on blue coin. If this hand was on blue coin, it would actually be a very, very bad blue coin hand. But because I'm on red coin, I can use this hand to make life as difficult as possible for my opponent. And that is very good for me. Now he's going to play another practice turn adjust. He's obviously struggling with proactivity. And now I guess we can start playing engines and seeing how we can do this round. So let's see what we can get out of him how we can go about this round since he had such an awkward um position to be in with the proactive plays that we made him do so now we'll play the seductress it's a little bit late but again we force him to be uninteracted had we started with this slice seductress he would have just killed all the tourney jars now because of the way we played it's actually might survive now he's playing a bribery now bribery is not a card that you often want to be playing as um nilf got right away in round one like this and he plays a madame savola or madame louise so i'm going to play this now 
I'm gonna click it once and then possibly play something like my urchin to get my boats out. And my opponents to be very careful. I could tempo ahead of him and win on even um, if I want to. So I'm gonna give him the opportunity to pass. Let's see if he takes the pass or not. And I guess at this point we're just playing out our cards, trying to win round one. And that's pretty good for us. Winning round one is great. Had we started with the Slice Seductress, it would have just died to a 20 jars. The fact that we delayed the Slice Seductress the way we did basically means it's actually surviving. And now we can see our opponent passes here and we get the round nice and easily. Get some thinning done, get maximum coin carry over, and now we're in a great spot for the rest of the game. So we're going into a situation now where we both use leader bullets. It's going to be completely top deck mode. Me against Skelliger. Top deck mode. And let's see what our top decks end up showing us. So we have Osral. That's going to be the best card left. We don't really have much other good cards left. Um... I think this is kind of okay. I'm gonna go. It's a very short round three. We could kind of be uninteractive with a hand like this. So, I think I'm gonna go ahead and play a heat wave on that. And just to be uninteractive as much as possible, let's see what his plays are gonna be. I know he's got a blood eagle in hand. We did see it in round number two. So he definitely has a Blood Eagle. He's going to play a Proactive Herald the Cripple. So this is a Blood Eagle. I know this is a Blood Eagle. I know this card is Blood Eagle in hand. We saw it in round 2. This card is 100% Blood Eagle. Now I could play this, but this, these both cards have Veil. Both of these cards have Veil. So playing this right now doesn't really achieve much. Um, it just gives him Blood Eagle value. Playing this card now doesn't really make much sense. It just gives him Blood Eagle. If I play this, he Blood, Eagle, Blood Eagle's a bronze. If I discard this, Oswald is exactly 14 points and it's enough to win here. So I may as well discard the Brooksa because playing the Brooksa right now achieves nothing. It lets him play Blood Eagle and he can Blood Eagle out of bronze and then um, he can actually win the game. So for that exact reason, I'm going to discard this Brooksa and his last card is Blood Eagle, which he'll have to discard and then... Um, we'll win the game with this Neuromancy onto an Osril, because Neuromancy onto Osril is exactly 14 points. Deny the Blood Eagle, and a Neuromancy Osril exactly takes it here. So, he now has to mulligan. He has now discard exactly. He has to discard the Neuromancy or the Blood Eagle. Now we go Neuromancy onto Osril, which is exactly enough points to do it by one. Okay, so we're in a, round, a long round three, what is against a double ball deck. Well, long round three, a medium length round three. Now, one thing that bull decks do struggle with is being proactive. And we are going to try and make and make things difficult for him. Now, our opponent does have final say, right? But we have a lot of uninteractive cards. Most of his cards are poison cards. Poison cards, aristocrats. He's going to play masquerade ball at some point. And when he plays masquerade ball, he can't poison cards with veil. So I'm going to use these cards that have veil to make life miserable for my opponent. I'm going to start off with an invader. I'm going to play all my Veil units, all my Berserk transform units, everything that I can to brick his aristocrats. I'm going to play stunning blows. I'm going to make things as difficult as possible for my opponent. Now, you don't always need final say or second say to be uninteractive. This is also a form of uninteractivity, playing units that your opponent can't properly interact with. So he's going to start with Masquerade Ball. Now, the thing about a Masquerade Ball deck is most of their cards are either poisons of some sort or aristocrats. Any aristocrat he plays will proc Masquerade Ball. If he procs Masquerade Ball, he will get a Fangs of the Empire, which will be forced to poison something. So I'm going to play the Stunning Blow now, and I'm going to force him to play Practice. He can't really interact with this. His cards are all poison cards. He can't poison this card. His cards are also aristocrats. If he plays aristocrat now, it'll proc a chapter of the Masquerade Ball, which will be a nightmare for him. So we're going to try to use this um, to make things very, very awkward for our opponent. This card that he has, by the way, is my Turg V. Turg V also can't can't give rupture to and now we see him playing the usurper general so that's a practice play that he can have but that's fine we'll go ahead then and play this be uninteractive once more so now we have two invaders on the board and again it's gonna be difficult for him to actually play something proactive right now he's gonna have to play an aristocrat i'm imagining his hand is probably things like vincent uh, maybe a van morland hunter um maybe morale just poison cards or aristocrats that he can't play. Maybe a Roderick. So he just cannot play proactively for very long. And we're going to use that to our advantage here. So let's see what his what his play is going to be about this. 
It's gonna be a Vincent. So the nice thing about this is, sure he gets to kill this, but now he's gonna proc one of the Fangs of the Empire, and now he poisons the invader. That poison does nothing. This Fangs of the Empire is now brick. So now I'm gonna go ahead and play a totem. Because these cards are also awkward. He, if he poisons these cards, then I can transform them into bear abominations by damaging them with the totem, and then he loses the poison again. So this is another form of uninteractivity, just forcing him to be proactive. And it is very difficult for him to do that. So let's see what his answer is gonna be for this. Gonna be a Tony Joust. Okay, Tony Joust is a fair enough answer. Fine. Um, I guess we're gonna go ahead and do this then. And I'm going to resurrect again this invader to be uninteractive. Another form of uninteractivity. So everything here he doesn't want to poison. There's just not good targets that he can poison that he can interact with. He's got a Turkvin in hand he can't use. He's got maybe a Roderick. Just stuff that doesn't work very well on this board state right now. So here we see him play the Roderick, and that's going to proc another chapter of this. So he gets the morale out, and that is going to be... He can poison this, sure, but it still made things very soft to me for me. And now, from this point on, we can do things like play leader ability onto a Skjordal, kill the morale, and play Blood Eagle for a Hemdal at some point, which will be quite nice. So, I guess... Um, we'll... So, we're in a situation here where we're playing a Roche, or a... Commando Swarm deck. I'm gonna play Pavetta now and I'm gonna put shuffle back all the commandos into my deck. Now from this perspective we're gonna be doing it my opponent is the one playing uninteractively just so you can see what it can look like from the other point of view. So it's a round three situation, very short round three. Um, I play the Pavetta, now all my commandos are back in deck. Obviously I need to get a death blow onto this Roche Merciless in order to be able to summon all these commandos from deck because I only have one leader charge left. I can't use two leader charge to get them all out. So if my opponent can deny this successfully, um, it could be awkward. So our opponent plays the Parasite, right? Now I need to set up a death blow. So I need this Mola to survive. Um, I need this Mola to survive to actually get a death blow. I, mean, I could use Fallible to set it up, but he can easily play around that too. So let's see what he does about this Mola. I need this Mola to actually survive to get the Roche Merciless death blow. Because I only have one leader charge left, which I need for all the commanders that I just shuffled back into the deck. So let's see what the opponent does here. He hasn't used leader charge yet. Obviously, he's going to probably keep that Fruits of Yuskirth to um, try and... To try and deny the death blow of the Roche Merciless. Because it's very important for him to deny this Roche Merciless death blow. Let's see if he's smart enough to understand how exactly he wants to go about denying this Roche Merciless. So, Mauler on the board, ready to go. And this could set up a death blow. He's going to take a Heat Wave. So, the fact that he plays a Heat Wave here, he's now played Parasite and he's played Heat Wave. He's also played a Thunder. Now, he can play a high base strength unit or high strength unit and the infallible won't be able to set it up. So I think my only chance now is to do something like play Roche, use one leader charge on it, I only have one leader charge, and get the commander out. Um, so get the commander out and let's see what he decides to do about this. Now, his hand could be something like I don't know, Osril, maybe Oberon. Could also be a Strigger, but I can't do anything about Strigger. If he has Strigger, he can always answer this. If he has Strigger and I play this dead, I can't play the dead fellow, it doesn't help me either. So he's going to play the Strigger here. And this is actually quite smart for him because if he had taken the Strigger onto the Mauler, if he, if I played Mauler and he played Strigger to kill the Mauler, I could have then played Fallible, damaged the Strigger down to two, and then I would have been able to um, Roche Merciless the Strigger. So the fact that he played Heat Wave, which is a more suboptimal manner to deal with my Mauler, meant that I had nothing to interact with my Fallible. So I was forced to play Roche now, and by doing so, he got the Strigger onto the um, Commander, the remaining Commando. So he played a suboptimal Heat Wave onto the Mauler, where he had a much better Strigger, but in doing so, it forced me to play Roche now instead of Fallible. Because had he played this first again, I would have been able to just do this. If, he, if I played Maul and he played Strigger, then I would have played Fallible onto the Strigger and then my Roche would have been able to get the Death Blow on this. So, very well played there, being uninteractive, playing a little bit suboptimally, but in doing so, making it very uninteractive for me. And now his final card is going to be a Neuromancy onto the Oberon and he'll win the game because of that play. So, very well played from him over there and being uninteractive to deny the Roche Merciless. Anyway, that is the video. Um, thank you again to Gravesh for joining me and helping me record it. But again, that is pretty much how this is going to work. 
again, you're not always going to be able to do this. It's not something you can do every game. It is very niche sometimes. Um, there are some situations, as we discussed here, where this can be very, very helpful and game winning. This is something you cannot do every game. So don't try and replicate this every single game because this is not something that you can do on a game to game basis. This requires you to, like I said, know your opponent's deck. It requires to understand your deck, your opponent's deck, and then find these situations where this can help you. So don't try and do this every game. Very important to understand that. But when you do find situations where this can work, you got to think about it, understand when it can be beneficial and how exactly your opponent's deck functions to break their cards potentially in situations like this. Anyway, I hope you guys found the video useful. If you did, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ask me any questions in the comment section below if you have any questions regarding this topic and I'll be more than happy to try answer um, some of them. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys again next time. Bye-bye.